Hello, and welcome to Rolling Out Star Studio. I'm your host, Portia Monique, and today we have a fantastic guest, Sky Alvester Black. He is a multifaceted dancer, singer, actor. He got his start in, of course, Tyler Perry films like Sisters. Y'all seen him on Sisters. Y'all seen him on All the Queen's Men. Uh, he, he was phenomenal in that. We, we actually need to talk about that because... If you guys haven't seen, he got shot. I, spoiler alert, he got shot. And, <laughs> and I need to know what happened because the next season, it, it just ended like that. He got shot and it ended. And we like, well, what happened? When's the next episode? But he's also known for playing in uh, Showtime's Black Monday as well. Welcome to the show, Sky Alvester Black. Hey, how you doing? <laughs> you just gave it to him. I did because they should have seen it by now. Y'all should have watched it by now. It, it's super hot. It's ten episodes. I watched them back to back to back to back, and I was well, I was I yearning for more. So thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Absolutely. And today we're going to be talking about your journey as an actor in establishing a brand as well uh, with being an actor, right? So I like to, before we even get into all that, I like to go back to the beginning of how you got started in this business. So um, of course you were a dancer, you danced for Beyonce, Rihanna, Mar- Mariah Carey, Tamar Braxton. Um, how did you get started in this business? And then how did you transition over into acting? But let's take it back to the beginning for you. Okay. Well, um, I am from Miami, Florida beginning, uh, the real Miami, I always say from, um, I'm from the hood. <laughs> I am from Carroll city, which is now Miami garden, but I was raised with my grandparents. And, um, I remember seeing a Michael Jackson video and I was in the kitchen and I, I told my grandmother I wanted to do that. And um, I broke my leg trying to emulate Billy Jean video. A lot of people don't know that. Like I was trying to step on the tile and I was, and I twisted my leg. But on um, fast forward, the beauty of, I think, growing up with my grandparents was the fact that they allowed me to explore. So when I said I wanted to do something, they were very supportive. And um, I said, I wanted to dance. And you got my grandparents from Alabama. So it's like you got Southern grandparents and now they have a grandson saying that they want to dance. And they're like, what do you mean? And luckily, my grandmother had, um, she loved tap and she loved Gregory Hines. So my grandmother and grandfather enrolled me in tap class, but they said that I would need ballet in order to, as a classical foundation. Mm-hmm. And um, imagine telling two Southern grandparents. <laughs> <laughs> that's like, their so grandson needs so ballet <laughs> <laughs> right how did that go and, um, <laughs> um they they acquiesced just because you know the way in which it was explained to them and and my grandparents had, had they had a really open mind which was is huge you know and um i hated it i'm not gonna lie fast forward to high school um and all through all through middle school, high school, like I played alto saxophone. They really thought I was going to be a musician because I was in the church choir and I played saxophone. Music was first in my life. And um, when I got to high school, I went to New World School of the Arts High School and I had a black male teacher tell me that I would never be a ballet dancer. And for me, I'm very big on dreams. And I think mm-hmm. that's, that's kind of how I am, why I, I love that. I love that that happened because it made me be like, oh, okay, buddy, well, you done messed up now. Right. So every bit of me went into training to do something that I thought was um, damn near impossible because people don't even realize ballet is uh, like, it's as athletic as football or more. Yeah. And I had to change my body. I had to work on flex. I, I had to work on strength because I was flexible, but I had to work on the strength that I have. And in, in two years' time, I was in New York on scholarship at School of American Ballet, which is one of the biggest ballet um, institutions in the United States. Wow. And all I wanted to be was a ballet dancer. Wow. And that's, what I, that's, that's what I wanted. And a lot of people don't realize that I was a professional ballet dancer before anything. That was my dream. Wow. My grandparents were like, wait, you don't, you not like, cause I didn't go to college. I went, I, I started my career right out of high school. 
um, I put down my saxophone. It was just like, well, what, is, what is this thing that is taking your life over? Because I was training. Eight, I was even training after school went in. I would go and train. I would wake up at 4.30 in the morning, go to school, and train to about 10 o'clock at night. Okay. And um, mm-hmm. yeah, so after, I mean, it was already kind of a trophy for me in my mind. This yeah. is what I was going to do. And um, I accomplished it. I accomplished it around, I would say, 16 was when I went professional. Wow. And um, actually, uh, Misty Copeland and I went into American Ballet Theater at the, during the same year. Misty uh, Copeland, we y'all. I don't know if y'all heard yeah. him say that, but it, he said Misty Copeland, but go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we both went into ABT the same summer. And um, and I, I became a professional. And... Um, I remember calling my grandparents and again, they were always so supportive because they, you know, you, you, you can't just make it on a scholarship in New York. You know what I mean? You have to have the, the aid of yeah. just, just to eat, to get around. And, and uh, my grandfather was a general contractor and had his own company. So, and they were able, financially able to help me and foster me and make it possible and make a way for it. And they always did that. Like my grandmother would pick me up at 11 o'clock at night from a dance school when she had to go to work in the morning at seven. Yeah. You know, so, uh, and sit out there and wait the whole time yeah. while I was there. Because, yeah. I, you know, we grew up in a rough area. So it, not a rough area, but you know, yeah. everybody, anybody that been to Miami know about Rick Rose and Carroll City, you know what I mean? So it's mm-hmm. like you catch mm-hmm. your public transportation. So by the time, you get there. I remember calling them, and it, I was in um, I was in Atlanta Ballet, and this is the first time I said that. It's the first time I actually named the company, um, out loud. And I was in Atlanta Ballet, and I remember calling my grandmother, and I said, um, I don't want to do this anymore. And they was just kind of like, Well, why? And I said, There's nothing like having everything you want and still feeling sad. Mm. And it was the first time I feel like, as a black man, I had been hit with real racism. And I remember having, uh, um, uh, and I just thought, you know, when you're a teenager, you, and you, you, you're striving for something, it's not in your head that adversity comes from the color of your skin. Right. You're thinking adversity is just like, okay, I got to get better. I got to get better. I got to get better. And I remember having um, a talk with um, the director then, and it was just said, you're great. You're amazing, actually, but no matter how good you are, there will never be a black cavalier, which is Prince, to a white sugar plum fairy here. And I was like, damn, I'm in the South. And I was just like, I don't want to do this. And my passion in that split second phew, went out the window, shifted. Wow. And I was just like, I was just like, I don't want to do this. My body, my, I, I had, I, by this time, I've had injuries, like a, like a, as if I was in the NFL. Right. You know, so um, I, I just remember telling my grandparents, I was like, this sucks, man. It, it, it was it was the worst thing ever. And they they just went with me. Yeah. Whatever I wanted. They, they went with me. Yeah. And um, I eventually moved to L.A., met a girl, <laughs> went back home, went back home to Miami because I was injured, met a girl. Um, she was the one who actually pulled me out to LA. I never thought that. I never wanted to go to LA. Ever. Okay. I never said that either. <laughs> you, what you bringing out of me today? <laughs> I, I, um, he loves I to hear it. To LA. Yeah. And I didn't, I didn't know, I didn't know that this whole world of commercial dance existed. And I went to LA. I, and um, I stayed in a one room studio with four other people, and we were on air mattresses, unbeknownst to my family, because they would have made me come home. <laughs> and, that's the um, white parents right mm-hmm. yeah oh yeah they, they baby they baby out. let's yeah. go <laughs> yeah yeah and i pawned my saxophone like, they didn't even know that i pawned my saxophone for 279 dollars to move to la because they would not you know yeah they're like what are you what are you doing and yeah. I, I, I um yes yeah, so i get there and i'm like shit what did i do with my life like walk into this one room studio but I had a friend that said, hey, I think you should dance again. You know, I just, on your, for your look, I can call to my agent. And I said, nah, bro, I'm cool. I'm gonna work at FedEx and I was gonna sing again and, and save up for studio time. Um, make this long story a little bit shorter. He, he called his agent, his agent called me in. They signed me just based on his word and based ah. on my background as a ballet dancer. Yeah. 
And I had an audition for Beyonce and Destiny's Child about three weeks later. And the assistant choreographer, um, and I'll shout him out too, Anthony Burrell, he said, and I knew him because he had danced with Alvin Ailey and I was dancing in New York at ABT and School of American Ballet at the same time. And mm -hmm. black folks kind of knew each other dancing, mm -hmm. <laughs> dancing in these big places. And he was like, watch him. And when they looked at me, I just knew, I was like, you don't know nothing about hip hop, bro, but you can't be the weakest link. Right. And I just adapted and I got the job. And mm -hmm. that's what started my actual commercial hip hop career in LA. And I just watched people that, that were, that I knew in my mind were good and that the, the, the teams gravitated to like the choreographic teams and, you know, mm -hmm. the artists. And I was like, all right, emulate that, emulate that, emulate that. Mm -hmm. And then it just, it kept going. It was Beyonce, then it was Mariah. Then I would go back to B, then I would go to Rihanna. Then it, it was just this continuous yeah. cycle of wow. a career that I never, never even knew about. I never even knew about the world. Sounds like an amazing story, right? So you started out in ballet um, for, you know, you said you didn't want to do it anymore after enduring that, that um, you know, what came with it. And then you said, let me go to LA. Your girlfriend pulled you out to LA. Um, and because of your background, you were able to immediately get picked up by some of these superstars, right? But mm -hmm. I also want to talk about your time in LA because you also said that you were in a one-room studio. You also said that you pawned your saxophone. Let's talk about being homeless in Hollywood and how that pushed you more towards making sure that you were going to be the success that we see today. Oh, yeah. I mean, it, it didn't even happen just once. You know, it happened. Um, I think when you're a kid, you're so fearless. And that's why I admire kids and their dreams. And that's that's my biggest thing. I, if someone has a dream, I'm like, go for it. You know, because as, as you get older, you get all these layers on you or people saying you can't and, or and you start to believe it. So um, I didn't think anything about it then. I'll be honest with you. I didn't think anything about it. I just thought this is life. You know, you're a young kid, you're in LA, you're doing what? I think the biggest thing was when I stopped my dance career at the height of it. And I said, this is no longer fulfilling me. And I, by this time I had met Debbie Allen and she had told me I was gonna be an actor. And, and another thing, I was concentrating on music. I never knew I was gonna be an actor. And the music journey actually made me homeless because I was so hell bent on it. And, yeah. um, and I did not care. I did not care. I was going to do whatever I had to do to make my dreams happen. And everybody had told me I always should be an actor. And actually my music manager said, yo, you should um, take acting classes again. And I was like, okay, but I was homeless at this time. I was, I was sleeping from couch to couch to couch. It was, I had a stint in Philly to where um, I went out there to pursue because there was a possible signing and that didn't happen. I was sleeping on studio floors. My grandparents didn't know that. I was just like, oh, I'm fine. I'm cool. <laughs> and, you know, but honestly, tears coming down at night sometimes. And my granddad, like, what are you doing? And why are you doing this? And and um, if they had, if even my granddad passed right before I made it. Sorry. Um, and he just wanted to see me make it, which kind of choked me up. Um, but if they had known a fourth of the things, and the fourth of my living conditions. I would say, come on, baby, come on home. Yeah, you, on you, you, you got it, you got it. But the thing about it is that there's a point in time as, as people, as humans, not it's just a man, as men, women, just humans, you have to believe in yourself yeah. and see it when nobody else sees it. Yeah. And um, luckily I had the support of them and financial support when I needed it, but there, there was a part of me that I was like, I can't, I can't continue to ask. Yeah, for I can't. I have to. I have to earn this. So I went home three times, three different times, um, post a lucrative dance career. And when I got into deeply into my acting, I was just like, it felt like home, and it felt like I was walking in purpose. And it, it, it was hard, man. I'm not gonna say it wasn't, um, but I knew it. I yeah. knew it. I knew it. There was nothing you could tell me that it wasn't going to happen. So I love that resilience in you. And I love that determination, too, in terms of just really going after. Got it on my neck. 
Let's <laughs> pat it on your neck. Let's see. Oh, okay. Oh, I love that. Okay. Um, and that's a real tattoo because we see in all the Queen's men that you got tattoos, you tatted it up. So let's pivot a little bit and let's go there, right? So you are on Tyler Pest. Tyler Perry sisters, you're on uh, Black Monday on Showtime. However, just recently, um, you were starring in All the Queen's Men, starring Eva, who plays Marilyn, Madame DeVille, um, Eva mm -hmm. Marcel. But let's talk about how that opportunity came about with All the Queen's Men. And then, because you know, I want to know, fast forward to how you got shot and how you're going to come back in season two. <laughs> because you're going to tell the people. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, what's going on? <laughs> um, so it, it was, it's funny that we're talking about this because I put it. I had a reflective moment um yesterday in the middle of filming, and I had some tears in my eyes. I, I've been getting real emotional lately. Um, I auditioned for all the Queens Men before I auditioned for Sisters. By the time I auditioned for all the Queens Men, it was I remember it was March twenty seventh, twenty twenty. It's okay. actually my little cousin's birthday, and um. I had just got laid off my valet parking job because of the pandemic. Um, I was valet parking cars prior um, for $13 an hour from seven in, at night to 3.30 in the morning. And um, so, and the week before I just got hit by a car, by yeah. an Uber driver on, on the driveway. Cause I'm, you know, trying to man the driveway to tell him to stop it. He didn't want to stop. So um, now I'm in this one, rep, one bedroom apartment with two other friends again my grandmother does not know the severity of the conditions <laughs> right? but she 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 knows but she doesn't because i don't like to worry her mm -hmm. and um i hit up three friends i got the audition by this time i don't i didn't even know that it was a tyler perry show okay because um all the queen's men it was i got the sides and I just knew that something told me don't audition the regular way. Don't just stand in front of a blank wall. And I, I'm deeply interested, well, I'm deeply like an artist. I love filmmaking, I'll say that. Okay. So I got, I called three friends, I got the steady cam, and I was like, follow me and do this and zoom in right here and everything like that. But I auditioned for that March of 2020. And just never heard back. I didn't, I didn't think nothing about it. And after I auditioned for Sisters, um, and I got Sisters, by the, I had auditioned for Tyler six times before I got Sisters. Wow. And um, yeah, I later learned the character had to match my look. And um, so with all the Queen's men, I think we, I had just been a sister season two, and I got a call. And from my agents. And I thought, real talk, I was in the middle of Zoom acting class. I thought I was about to get dropped. Oh, no. Like, Damn, I'm going to get dropped. It's the end of the year because I had transferred to one of the big agencies, which is Gersh. Um, and I was like, oh, this sucks. I'm sorry, because I didn't even realize I said that. We can't hear you, but go ahead. But um, he said, um, my agent, he said, can I tap your manager? And I was like, sure. He was like, oh, we'll sit down. He was like, um, Tyler Perry Studios just called and Tyler gave you leave in his new show. All the Queens Men. I was like, what? And I was like, oh my gosh, I auditioned for that a year ago. And I first thing I did was I got on the floor I, and I said, thank you, God. And tears came down my eyes. And I called my grandma and I said, Ma, I, know you, I can take care of you now. Oh. That's the first thing I said. And um, um, it just took on this whole journey and everything you see of AMP, I think that's why I think it's very good to trust your instincts. Um, from the Scully, I didn't have enough money to get a haircut. So oh my God. The Scully, because I didn't want to look bad in an audition, but AMP was a Scully. I wore the Tims. Um, and I, I think, you know, God allows you to go through things for a reason. And, and I'm happy about the journey, but I didn't, I had no idea that, um, that it was coming and what people don't even realize all the queen's men was actually only eight half hour episodes originally mm. and we filmed it in november december and then we got a call and that was after i got lace and tyler said um but we got we got a call and said tyler loved the show so much that he um 
just extended it to an hour long and now two more episodes, 10 episodes. So we're bringing you all back to Reese shoot and he's giving you this huge raise. Wow. And it was just kind of like, you know, from, and then I, I got a chance to talk to Christian about it because Christian wrote this from his book called Lady Christian Facts. Keys. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Christian Keys. And mm-hmm. Chris, I always say Christian made a way for the Bays brothers. <laughs> ah. And, <laughs> and um, <laughs> shout out Christian. Um, and yeah huge shout out to Christian Keys and he mm-hmm. actually wrote AMP for himself right when he first wrote the project mm-hmm. and and so seeing and he said when I saw you I was like that's it it's like he, he gets it the beats and everything and I think I was just going through a really tough time of life and I could understand I got it even though I've never been to prison I understood what it was like for a kid that's just trying to get out and make it. Yeah. Yeah. Now and fast forward. Right his wrongs. Yeah. Get out, make it, and try to write his wrong. But you know, we're trying to get to what happened after you guys shut Okay. Shut- oh, okay. Season two coming. It gotta be a season two coming, but you need to let us know what the heck happened and how you got shot and how you come back from that. Okay, so it from my from, I don't know how I'm coming back. We gotta ask the writers. I, oh my I'm, I'm god! Waiting to, I don't know. I have no idea. Uh, okay, so we haven't I'm, started I'm a, shooting for season two yet because season no, two we, no, we has haven't. to happen, right? We, we we from if let's pray it does. Right? No, it has to. <laughs> no, no, it has to because we can't end the season like that and you know not know what happened or should say it loud say tell everybody season two has to happen season two has y'all. to happen i mean <laughs> we're standing by we're we're waiting like we need season two to yeah, um, we need season two like right now <laughs> yeah, f was actually um in my mind well from from story amp was really going to um his aunt's house to say yo i got an apartment i did it you know, I'm excited. I want to tell you, thank you for helping me. Um, I, I really did it. I saved up all this money. It's been two months and I'm out of halfway house and I really, really am getting back on on track to to having a life. Yeah. And just in that fell swoop. Well, we don't stand by for that. And we are all waiting to see what happens because that was an excellent series. And we know that season two is 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 going to happen shortly. We just, we're waiting on it. So. We're going to speak it into existence. We're speaking it into existence. But before we let you get out of here, I also wanted to talk to you a little bit about creating your brand as an actor, as a dancer first, as a singer, and then of, of course, as an actor now. Um, mm-hmm. How did you, how did you establish your brand as an actor and what would you say your brand is? I would say I established my brand as an actor by just honestly working hard. Like everybody always asks, so what's the fastest way to get there? But there is no fastest way. You got to study your craft. I tell everybody that. God first, hard work and sacrifice. A lot of people don't want to sacrifice. It's like, you don't, if, if, if I always thought, yo, if I can, if I have $50 to go and eat lunch or eat brunch, um, I could put that acting classes only at that time was $200 a month. I could tell you that that's, that's that's a class yeah you know it's it's whatever you want and i always been like hard work is the tool there's only so much networking you can do and there's yeah. only so much so much finagling you can do you really have to walk the line of work do the work if yeah. you do the work and you make the sacrifice you'll get there that's the, the fastest road the fastest path from anywhere is point a to point b straight line yeah. and um I think my brand has been, and that's a good question. I think I'm very transparent. And and I, I'm I'm very transparent about my journey. And I believe in dreams turning to reality. I I, I don't I believe that. I preach that. I preach like people always ask me, well, I don't know what to do. Yes, you do. You do there's an internet. We have we have unlimited resources yeah. if you yeah. want to go to class you can go to class i tell women i say yo you cannot get your nails done i've gone i can't tell you how many times i've gone without a haircut i've met my last year was the first time i ever went on a vacation in my life wow ever i felt one i hadn't earned the right to vacate to go on a vacation 
And two, I just didn't have it. Mm-hmm. It, it. It's like, it doesn't, if it didn't serve the goal or the purpose of what I saw for myself, every, everything else, I, I trimmed the fat, man. And and I do believe my brand now has just been um, persistence, tenacity, and resilience. Persistence, and, tenacity, and, and resilience. Okay. Yeah. And work. Do the work. Now, how do you separate your brand from others in your industry as an actor now? You know what? That's a good question. I don't think I actually make a, con- a, a conscious decision. I live in my truth and I tell my story. And the be- most beautiful part about that, no matter how many people there are, there's only one you. Yeah. So if you just stay true to who you are and and not try to, we live in this social media age where everybody want to be lit. It's okay not to be lit. It's okay. You know, like, it's okay not to be lit. Be you. Right. Yeah. You are lit. Yeah. Because somebody needs to, you, whatever you're going through is going to help somebody else. Yeah. And I just think authenticity. Authenticity. I, I just try to say often, authentic to my circumstances. And it seems to be working. Now, let's talk about social media for a second. Um, what role does it play in helping you to build your brand? Um, like you said, everybody on social media wants to be lit. But how do you use social media to make sure that you are increasing your brand and uh, being authentic to your brand? I'm not going to lie. I got my little thirst traps <laughs> out there. But, um, but um, I work out hard and I don't eat of the Southern food that I like for them thirst traps. <laughs> so like yeah, okay. that's self-motivation. Yeah, um, yeah. But at this point in my career, I think it's really what I've noticed is just sharing my journey has really increased my brand. And, and believe it or not, people really respond to a brand that they, they see grow. They see the work. Like even in our biggest stars, we love Beyonce. Yeah, we love Beyonce. But Beyonce is a workhorse. And we love Beyonce because she's great. Yeah. She's great first. And then everything that is Beyonce comes around that. Even Cardi B, you see, you've seen the growth and the hard work from, I used to look at Cardi B just in her apartment on, on talking about whatever, but she was also persistent at what she wanted to do. And, and um, I think if you tell real moments on social media, I'm not saying tell your business, I'm not saying that, and this, but I'm saying like people need inspiration because there's so much mess and anarchy in the world. Inspiration, that's what I've been using social media for. Mm I love it. I love it. Before we get out of here, um, it's definitely been a pleasure to speak with you today. I can see your authenticity shining through. And thank you so much for being transparent. Shout out to your grandparents for making sure that thank they you. were an amazing. They, they're incredible. They were very supportive with you, for you along the way as well. But before we get out of here, tell us what projects are you working on? Um, the new ones, what's coming up? What do you have on the way? Those type of things. Um, there's a project called Lace, which is on AMC All Black, and um, it is airing very soon. That's all, <laughs> that's all I can say. I'm very excited about that. I get to play a high-powered attorney, a fellow Charles. And um, the reason why I'm so excited about that is because it shows Black men and women and people of color that you can have tattoos. They allow me to keep my tattoos playing a Harvard attorney. So it goes against what the status quo is. And I speak five different languages. Okay. So it goes against what the status quo of one may think when they versus profession. So I can be a professional with an open like a shirt with tattoos and be taken seriously. Um, I'm, right now I'm in the middle of filming um, a new film, which I don't know if, how much I can say. So I ain't trying to have my producers mad at me. Very excited about it because it's my first film as a leading man. So I'm, I'm um, I'm geek. What's your dream role before we get out? I know I can talk to you all day, but what's your dream role? Like, what do you want? What do you aspire to um, play as the, your dream role? Um, I like a lot of um, sci-fi action thriller okay. stuff. Okay. So um, I like to venture over into other worlds and like, okay. that go beyond. Like, like I love The Watcher and I love like 
I would love craft country and stuff oh. like that. But and I also like to touch on like historic things. So like I'm I want to jump over into like being able to follow the Will Smith trajectory and produce and all that stuff. So there's a there's a story, a couple of stories like about Black Caesar that I would love to tell. There's this story about the first black samurai in the 1400s in France that I would love to tell. There's um the attorney that went up against uh Truman that I would love to tell. So those like really like informative roles that got a little bit of action in there. I would love to tell. All right. So fascinating. We love it mm-hmm. all. Um, give us your social media handles. Where can we follow you? Where can we see some of those thirst traps? Because you know people are gonna be looking for them. <laughs> <laughs> and we're gonna just stay tuned to all of the things that you have going on. Well, you can see all my thirst traps on Instagram. I'm a, I'm an Instagram guy. Um, I I'm trying to get it more into Twitter. Um, Twitter, y'all need to verify me. <laughs> I'm trying to get more into Twitter, but um, Sky Black S K Y H B L A C K on um Instagram. And I don't really have I don't have a Facebook, so I'm only I'm on Instagram for the most part. Okay. Well, it's been a pleasure speaking with you today, learning about your journey, looking forward to seeing you in season two, first and foremost, of All the Queen's Men, <laughs> and then your <laughs> upcoming projects as well. Uh, we'll stay tuned. We appreciate you stopping by Rolling Out Star Studio and talking about your brand and all of the things that you have going on. Thank you so much, Sky Alvester Black. Thank you. Thank Thank you, Portia. It's been a pleasure. And thank you guys for tuning in to another episode of Rolling Out Star Studio. I'm your host, Portia Monique. And stay tuned to more episodes. We appreciate you guys. Take care. All right.